Good morning. Did you see the Pope's presentation, his sermon last night at the family conference in Philadelphia? It was just filled with passion and compassion. And today's gospel, Jesus displays compassion also. When he talks about if your hand sins against, causes you to sin, then cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Now, certainly he's not talking about self-mutilation, but this does show compassion because he refers to these body parts in the third person, almost as if they have a will of their own. He's showing us that it is very difficult to stop these actions as if they happen irregardless of our own mind. And so the compassion that he shows is wonderful, and yet he also describes that it's better to suffer the consequences of cutting your foot, hand off, your eye gouged out, than to suffer the consequence of being thrown into the fires of Gehenna. Now, Gehenna was a trash dump that was always on fire at the bottom of the hill from Jerusalem. In fact, one of the kings actually sacrificed his son in those fires. So seeing these fires burn all the time was a very visceral message that Jesus gave of how bad that is. And there seems to be this confusing reference to this action that doesn't seem to be within our control completely. And so perhaps turning to neuroscience might give us a little bit of a better understanding of the scripture. The human brain obviously is the source of thoughts, and these thoughts are pre the ones that precede any actions of our hands, feet, and eyes. And these thoughts come from the brain, but the brain is in, divided into two parts. 5% of it is conscious, and 95% of it is unconscious. The 95% is the oldest part of the brain, and fortunately it exists, because if it didn't exist and we had to consciously think about breathing all the time, then we would certainly die within a very short period of time. We couldn't stay awake constantly. There are other things in this unconscious brain. The unconscious brain is very fast and very efficient. It's the oldest part of the brain and yet contains many other things. It contains our habitual virtues, which is a good thing. It contains our prejudices, sexism, racism, economism, religionism. It contains our worldview. If we were born in Tibet, then we would probably have an unconscious worldview as a Buddhist. And the unconscious also contains our habitual flaws, which is what this gospel is talking about. The 5% the of our brain is the conscious brain. And that 5% is much more logical, it's slower, it's the youngest part of the brain. And fortunately we have that so that we can discern when we need to the things that are right and wrong. And the question then becomes, well, did in Christ's time were people aware of this problem? Well, Paul actually writes in Romans about basically saying, I sin even though I don't want to sin, and I don't do the good things that I want to do. It's almost as if Paul understood the unconscious and conscious, even though in those days they didn't distinguish it that way. So Paul even struggled with the same issue. And science goes on and further points out the real difficulties that we can have in this regard. It's called confirmation bias. Science has shown that as part of our human nature, we tend to preferentially pick only the data that supports our preconceived ideas in our unconscious and preferentially discard the data that challenges it. And it's, this is almost the uh, scientific equivalent of original sin. And so we, end, we have this bias built in which makes it even more difficult to deal with the unconscious. So the question is, 
how do we get the unconscious brain to unload to the conscious brain so that we can deal with these issues? Now, there are, there's one way that that can be done, and that's through suffering. Now, we don't certainly intentionally choose suffering. If we, uh, we wouldn't do it on purpose. But there is a, a way that suffering can have that effect. So, for example, if our hand reaches out to take a drink, and an alcoholic drink, and then it reaches out to take another drink and another drink, it gets to the point where our family is jeopardized. We cause suffering to our family, to our children, uh, to our spouse, all because we are failing to acknowledge in the conscious mind that we are an alcoholic. And so we wish to try to down, unload that conscious mind to have to deal with it. And we're forced into unloading it when suffering begins. That's why, as Catholics, we often say that suffering has the potential to be salvific. And so the conscious mind then kicks in and says, at a critical moment, we have a chance to decide, are we going to go to AA? Are we going to admit that we're an alcoholic? Or are we going to continue down the path and continue to suffer? There is another way, and that is prayer. Now, one of the, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit, but one of the uh, analogies that a neuroscientist uses used to describe the unconscious and the conscious is that the unconscious brain is like the uh, manufacturer, the, the, the workers on the floor of the manufacturing facility making widgets. They make these widgets methodically, repetitively, repetitively, one after another, and everything goes fine until the widget machine breaks down. Now, when the widget machine breaks down, they don't know how to fix it. So they go to the chief operating officer, who is the an analogous to our conscious brain, and he knows how to fix the widget. He goes to the right vendor. He thinks the problem through. Now, he himself couldn't necessarily run the machines in a efficient way, the way the unconscious mind uh, laborers do, but as the conscious mind, he fixes it. And that is why suffering is a vehicle to kick in the conscious mind, the chief operating officer, to fix the problem. Now, prayer is another way of unloading the unconscious. Now, how does that work? Well, prayer focuses our conscious brain on God. And in that focused effort, we tend to have more room left in our conscious brain for the unloading of the unconscious. What happens is that we are focused on God and we have less ruminations of our brain on thoughts that are extraneous to prayer. And so it opens the door for possible unloading. Now, from the Greek, there are two different types of prayer. There's cataphatic and apophatic. Cataphatic is discursive prayer, where we use our brain to think of prayers verbally and sometimes mouth them with our lips. These are the prayers that we're most familiar with, adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, supplication. But the other form is apophatic, and this is a form of prayer that the monks and nuns use in the monasteries, and there are various forms of apophatic, but it's basically a silent prayer without engagement of our thoughts. Basically, what we are doing is we are focusing on a symbol of our desire to be with God, and every time we become aware that we are engaging our thoughts, we ever so gently return to that sacred image or word as a way of saying that we would rather be with you, God, than even our own thoughts. Now, this even more dramatically enables the unconscious mind to download and unload into the conscious mind because now the conscious mind is being freed up. And once it's downloaded and uh, into the conscious mind, then we can deal with it in a very loving way, and we have an opportunity to correct our behavior. Now, this form of prayer started really with uh, Jesus in Matthew 6.6 6, when he said, When you pray, go to your inner room, close the door, and pray to your heavenly Father in secret, and he will hear you in secret. Do not you be like the pagans who use many words. So 
This was further described by, in the fourth century by the first desert fathers and mothers as they tried to study what Jesus was saying. And it takes on several forms. One is centering prayer, one's Lectio Divina. And perhaps a true story we will help. Cement. A man who took a workshop on centering prayer, uh, about three months later I happened to bump into him and I asked him, how is it going? And he said that he started to dream at night of what really happened to him in Vietnam. Now, I didn't realize that he had a PTSD problem, but, and he didn't tell me what the, the problem was, what actually happened, but it was clearly very serious. And so then I asked him, what did you do then? Now, in this prayer, as I mentioned to you before, we end up generally, gently letting go of our thoughts when we become aware we're engaging with them and we return to God. Well, he was starting to have these true memories come back even outside the prayer because the prayer gives us practice. And so when I asked him, what did you do then? He said, then I became fully aware during the day what really happened to me in Vietnam. This is profound. The divine therapist is intervening here and unloading the unconscious to the conscious mind. The conscious mind protects itself from these memories normally until the conscious mind is ready to handle them. And the divine healer is here now handling that for him. And so then I asked him the key question, what did you do then? And he said, I ever so gently let those thoughts go and I returned to God. What an amazing effect apophatic prayer can have and how God can utilize it to help us and I told this story to the head of the psychiatric department of one of the major hospitals in Houston. I don't want to say which one to give the name away. And he was stunned. His jaw dropped. He said, we are having difficulty treating PTSD patients. We don't know exactly how to handle it. And he said that he was just stunned by the story. So the question then becomes, what are we going to do? Are we going to continue to press the foot against the pedal of our car to cut the person off after they cut us off and risk an accident and thus some tremendous suffering? Or are we going to practice prayer so that we, are enab we enable ourselves to instantaneously let these, these things go without pressing down with our foot? Are we going to continue to reach for that drink one time after another, thus risking suffering and hurt for others, or are we going to turn to prayer to preempt the possible suffering and to deal with the problem? Are we going to allow our eyes to continually go to the internet and look at pornography and continue to do it such that it causes pain and hurt to our family, to our children, uh, to our spouse? Or are we going to move to prayer to help preempt those suffering ways and change our bad habitual flaws? If a workshop on centering prayer were available, would we be willing to take that workshop to learn how to do this practice in prayer and in apophatic prayer?